Hey guys, this is Justin Hello, and welcome to another video. So, something a little bit different today. As of late, we've been spending time bullying ships that I don't like in Star Wars or other vessels like the awful ATPT. Instead, today I thought it might be interesting to look at some of the ships used by the Galactic Empire, which were actually good. Now, before we continue, let me know down in the comments, what do you expect me to put and what's your personal favorite? With that being said, you'll have a second to think about that because I want to tell you about but my friends Vite Ramen who are sponsoring today's video. Now, if you've been subscribed to the channel for a while, you'll know that Vite Ramen has been partnered with the Eckhart's Ladder YouTube empire for a while now. Vite Ramen is an American owned small business. They pay their employees a living wage, which I think is super important. And overall, they're just good people. That's the boring stuff though. I mean, come on, who cares really about living wage? What you're probably here for is the fact that they make amazing ramen. Fight ramen is faster and a lot easier than eating out, and it tastes delicious. What's more, we actually partnered, Vite Ramen and I, to make a special Eckhart's Ladder flavor, Masaman Curry. It's so good that right now it's totally sold out. I'll let you guys know when it's back. You really have to be quick because people love this thing. But in the meantime, I would personally really recommend the roasted soy chicken. It's delicious. And if you follow my link in the description, viteramen.com slash Eckhart's Ladder, you'll get 10% off your order, free shipping within the contiguous USA, and some free gifts. With that being said, let's get back to the topic. And just as a reminder, we're talking about the Empire's well-designed ships. I think there's a difference as well between well-designed and effective. Something like the Imperial class Star Destroyer was incredibly effective because of its size and the lack for a long time at least of other ships which could really match its firepower. The Imperial Star Destroyer was certainly effective at spreading and enforcing Imperial power, and it worked well within the fleet, but I think that was overall due to Imperial naval doctrine as a whole, rather than any particular features of the ship other than its size. Let's compare that with the first Imperial ship that I think was overall very effective, the Lancer. Now, I've talked about before how I think the Lancer was probably misused by the Empire, but it was essentially designed as a counter specifically to Rebel Starfighters, and it did its job very well. Despite only being 250 meters long, the Lancer was armed with over 20 quad laser cannons, and was one of the few ships that could actually counter Rebel hit and run tactics. If a starfighter gets near this ship, it's probably getting shot down. The Lancer was designed for large capital ships or even installations. However, the Empire often chose instead to rely on TIE fighters. I bet you that the Star Destroyers being picked apart by B-Wings at the Battle of Endor wish they had a few Lancers lying around. All right, next I want to talk about the Nebulon B. And most of you probably know that this ship was originally of Imperial design before it was co-opted by the Rebel Alliance. My friend EC Henry did a really cool render of what he thinks an Imperial Nebulon B could have looked like. I'll show it on screen right now and also link it down below. But all the lore seems to indicate that the Nebulon B, despite its appearance, wasn't actually stripped down of anything. That's simply how it looked. The praises of the Nebulon B are actually sung by the Essential Guide to Warfare, which says the EF-76, that's the name of the Nebulon B, was an ungainly combination of weapons, sensors, and tie racks that became the most effective light warship of recent centuries. The word ungainly there, by the way, is one of the things that indicates to me that the Imperial Nebulon B looked like the Rebel Nebulon B, but yeah, this was a brutally practical vessel, besides for at least the midsection where the ship can crack in half, but hopefully the shield will stay up all the time anyway. So why was it so effective? Well, despite its relatively low mass, and I guess its lesser intimidation factor when compared with other ships, the Nebulon B sported, as mentioned, advanced sensors, 12 turbo lasers, and also 12 point defense cannons, meaning that, in combination with other vessels, it could take on capital ships while also screening against starfighters. The TIE Fighter rack system also meant that it could carry a good amount of starfighters for its size, making it just an all-around effective vessel, especially against the Alliance. I mean, we've got a relatively small ship that can respond flexibly to anything its size or under, pretty much perfect on the front line or off. Ultimately, the Nebulon B would inspire other vessels, including the Corona-class frigate of the New Republic. 
That same section in the Essential Guide to Warfare also mentions the IPV-1, which it says was a Corvette-sized patrol craft with a small flight crew, impressive performance, and heavy armament, but no hyperdrive and light shielding. The IPV-1s were deployed in large numbers and, through speed, coordination, and swarm tactics, could, and I quote, defend systems against almost any opposition. You might notice so far that a lot of the ships I'm talking about are these sort of small systems vessels, you might even call them. We don't necessarily think about them as warships and they're probably not the first thing you'll be seeing in a major battle but effective vessels nonetheless. Another good example would be the Carrick class. This was a 350 meter long vessel which packed a lot of firepower and was meant to operate like the IPV flexibly and with other ships of its class. Carricks, despite being Clone War or perhaps even pre-Clone War in design, were still serving as flagships for small battle groups as we see, for example, in the Trusa Pakura. Another very practical ship which I quite like was the Strike Cruiser. This was another small ship that could actually be modified to fit different mission profiles. It was not the only modular Imperial capital ship. I mean, there was literally a modular task force cruiser, but in my opinion, it was the most prominent one. It just seems very practical for an empire which was at times spread thin and where single ships might need to take on different duties. So there are a couple more ships that I want to talk about, but I do just generally want to note that I'm mostly skipping the Star Destroyer-like vessels I could talk about Venators, I could talk about Victory Star Destroyers, I could even talk about, for example, things like the Enforcer or the Interdictor, but those have been covered quite frequently on this channel and in other places, so I'll mention them here and leave it at that. The Victory, though, has got to be one of my overall favorites. The Interdictor Cruiser, as well, is so smart because it neutralizes the Rebels' main advantage, the fact that they get in, do damage, and jump away to hyperspace, but I mean, that's kind of the strength of the technology overall. The last ship I want to talk about is the Imperial Escort Carrier, and and to be fair, I could swap this ship out, which I'll call the Ton Falk or the Escort Carrier, with the Quasar Class Fire Carrier, which essentially did the same thing. The Quasar Class has been used more prominently in, for example, Star Wars Rebels and in Alphabet Squadron, but the principle is the same as the Ton Falk in that it's essentially a flying hangar. I was doing some research for this, and according to Wikipedia, always a reliable source, of course, the Ton Falk is the smallest ship which could carry a full wing of starfighters i.e. 72 starfighters. I don't know where that citation comes from, but it sounds correct to me, and that's really the strength of the Ton Falk. It was, unlike many Imperial ships, purely utilitarian in purpose. It wasn't meant to be frightening or to take on a role as a capital ship killer despite its obviously other intended purpose. No, this was quite simply a flying hangar. I mean, the ship did have a few anti-starfighter lasers, so it could even contribute a bit when it came to capital ship screening, which, I mean, makes sense. You want your escort carrier to be close to your big ships, not just because the name sucks otherwise, but because that way it can launch fighters and still contribute to the battle while also backing up and not taking too much turbo laser fire. But yeah, it was really all about the fighters, and the Empire was unique in that they didn't usually add hyperdrives to their star fighters, so carriers were really essential for their navy. One thing that was somewhat unique about the escort carrier was that it could actually perform in system hyperspace jumps, micro jumps, probably due to a very expensive and effective navigational computer and a precise hyperdrive. But those are just some ships that I thought I would include. I thought also maybe talking about the Bellator, but I believed I covered the strengths of that ship in a prior video. Let me know your thoughts down below. And again, thanks to Vite Rum for sponsoring this video. You can check their stuff and also keep an eye out for the return of the Masaman curry noodle flavor by visiting the link down in the description. Until next time, guys, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.